So uh, it's not yet in place or hadn't been in place, but uh, we're, we're working together with the, uh, the counterparts in Northern Ireland to get that up and running and that they can, so they'll, 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 they'll get there. Hello and welcome to AgriFocus, brought to you by AgriLand. I'm Stella Meehan and today I'm joined by Beef Sector Manager with Borbia, Mark Zieg. Mark, thanks for joining us. I want to talk to you first about the Protected Geographical Indication Status, that's PGI status for a product. So we've talked a lot about this recently on AgriLand, but First of all, would you be able to explain to people, I suppose in layman's terms, what a PGI is? You know, where does it come from? Who does it? Okay, uh, so um, the PGI essentially is an it's a it's a vehicle or a, a protection that the EU Commission have put in place for uh, regional products that have specific qualities, are unique, and that reputation. And, and and specificness is is uh, related to the region or the geography where they, where they come from. So it it has to have a re- reputation that is protectable, um, and it has to be unique. I suppose. So some examples of that would there would there be like it doesn't have to be in Ireland, you know, in other countries. Yeah, in in Ireland we we don't have so many of them, and I know it's 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 something that the the Department of Agriculture who who um, Run this and administer it in 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 Ireland are keen to uh, to get more and have a number um, on on the case. Um, so ones that we might know in Ireland are things like the Waterford Bla, um, Connemara Hill Lamb. Um, there are a few black puddings. Um, um, Sneem is, is is one of them. The other one uh, escapes me. Um, Tim League actually. Uh, there it is. And then in Europe, you you have a lot of them indeed. In our supermarkets, we we probably uh, see the little uh, yellow and blue disc with the um, oh. with, with the European symbol on it, and and they yeah they tend to be uh, regionally produced. Um, you know, normally more more premium um, because they have these qualities. So uh, things like Parma ham um, ha- has it. Has the 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 PGI now? Sorry, when I say that, there's also a, a slightly different version, but it's it's, it's broadly similar uh, in in layman's t- terms. A PDO, which is uh, instead of the blue, it has a has a red. Um, there there would be Parmesan cheese, feta cheese, um, uh, balsamic vinegar of Modena, um, lots of things like that. So in in Italy alone, there's over two hundred and seventy five. PGIs in in operation. Um, other countries like Spain, Greece, France would would um, have similarly um, high numbers. So yeah, a lot of regional products we there you know like brie and camembert and. So they're all food and drink products. Um, mainly food and drink products. Yes, I think there are a few other product categories that um, they, these these can be given. But yeah, we'd we'd see it mainly on food and drink. So let's talk then specifically about the PGI application for Irish grass-fed beef. So give us some history about this in terms of, you know, people hear a lot of bureaucracy of things that go between the department and Europe and so on. But I think farmers just want to know, you know, how did it come about? Did someone go into a meeting in Borbia or the department years ago and go, you know, lads, I think we should get a PGI for beef in this country? Or how does it come about? Um, yes, it's it's an interesting one because it has um, uh, we we have actually put together an application before uh, in the early two thousands um, for Irish beef, um, and uh, that that wasn't successful obviously at the time, and um, then back in in twenty nineteen um, we were. Um, Encouraged, or there, there, there were some uh, discussions that uh, the then Commissioner Hogan, in fairness, was uh, involved in, um, where uh, you know he he was reminding us that it was something that it, it um, we uh, we you know we 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 should be able to uh, to do this, and we we shouldn't give up on our on our previous uh, um, experiences. So it really uh, kicked off. In earnest, from then that we we engaged um, with the Department of Agriculture, um, so they're the competent authority on this, um, and um, Board Bia, I suppose, as the the the, the main um, promotion agency, 
and I suppose with the tools in place because uh, so we are the group who are are um, who, who are applying for this now in combination with our colleagues at the Livestock and Meat Commission in, in, in Northern Ireland. So that, that's the part of the, the, the slightly longer process here that we have joined them in. Um, and, and this will be an all-island Irish grass-fed beef uh, BGI. So there's a, a lot of different parts uh, involved. And the reason, I suppose, that we are involved, it doesn't mean that only we can be involved. Other uh, groups can also come up with um, with, with separate um PGIs like you already have, in fairness, for um, Connemara Hill Lamb as well. That that that's one that's um, I- existing. Um, but in terms of coming up with those proofs that are very important to the EU Commission, that you don't just get this on the basis of a um, you know a, a good story. You have to be able to prove those points as, that you make as the key qualities that differentiate your product and make it unique and make it protectable like this is the thing ultimately it has to be something this is nearly like trademark um like a trademark it has to be unique and protectable so when farmers are reading about the pgi application for irish grass-fed beef you know be it in media or online and so on and they thought it went through a few years ago as in the application to the european commission and now they're hearing that Northern Ireland opposed it and they might not understand what that whole process meant. So essentially, Mark, that was a case of the Republic of Ireland went forward for the PGI for Irish grass-fed beef. But I suppose because Northern Ireland and Northern Irish beef farmers operate, obviously, the same system, we're on the same island, we have the same climate, more or less, you know, they were like, well, we should include the whole island. And then was it the case then that the process yes. has to start again and go back with a sort of predominantly the old application, but with additional features to include Northern Ireland? Perfectly, perfectly uh, true, Stella. That um, that that is 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 how it was. Um, that that somebody had to had to 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 go forward uh, with it. So uh, so we did, and then it was the the mechanisms, I suppose, within the uh, the the commission that um, Northern Ireland could be added in. You're perfectly correct that. Irish beef is produced um, north of the border as well, and that is sold in Europe. And we have um, accounts over the years, like uh, the Albert Hein supermarkets, for instance, to take one in, in the Netherlands, where Irish beef and Irish grass-fed beef uh, from both sides uh, of the border uh, would have been produced. So it's you know it's it's perfectly uh, applicable. Very small tweaks in 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 the file to be made. Um, in 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 fairness, uh, most of the, the the things could be seamlessly uh, translated, and and we know our, our colleagues up there are um, our counterparts, should I say, are are working on on putting those proofs in place. We were fortunate, I suppose, in in terms of this is Irish grass fed beef, in that we had a uh, have the grass fed standard here, and and that's the main provable requirements here for the. Uh, the the PGI is is that it has to be uh, grass fed as as deemed by the standard, which is ninety percent grass fed in the diet. Um, to, and they can prove that in Northern Ireland also. Uh, that's what they're working on okay. now, just to put that because we had the grass fed standard, which has come out of our quality assurance and oh, the okay. um, the 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 sustainability element that we have, the Origin Green. So that was something that was coming to us, and and that has been in place. Um, for about three or four years now, and we're actually selling uh, some of that product on on the market in countries like like Italy. So uh, it's not yet in place or hadn't been in place, but uh, we're we're working together with the uh, the counterparts in Northern Ireland to get that up and running, and that they can. So they'll they, they'll they'll get there and and be able to do that. So the latest on it, Mark, is that the European Commission published this new full application, which is an all-island PGI application for Irish grass-fed beef. So now it goes through the process where it's open for opposition. And I think that the general feeling that I'm getting, certainly from the sector, from government and so on, and from Borbia, is that the likelihood is that the PGI will be registered. But um, is there any potential there for any other country to offer any sort of submission um, in opposition? I mean, I'm being very cynical here, but there'd hardly be any of our competitors that would would put in an opposition submission. 
No, no, you're 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 quite right, Stella. That um, it's that's, that's a very accurate representation. <laughs> Obviously, we have been. So the format for this is that when we started the PGI, we we had the uh, consultation phase in Ireland, um, and you know there were a number of of, of comments and 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 different uh, things came in, and we we had to deal with them, and then we were able to to go forward to uh, to to the initial. Uh, consultation phase were in Europe where it was just um Ireland Republic of Ireland that went through and we had no problems there 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 were no objections so we could get objections here um that would not be unusual or would not um uh, be insurmountable we 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 would have to address those to the um satisfaction of 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 the commission um we didn't as i say get them the last time we would hope that would be very much the case, but we can't prejudge that. Um, it, so we'll 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 have to see what comes. But um, it's a it's a very significant step that takes takes three months now. We're uh, almost two two weeks in it into it this week. Um, so you know we 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 hope that um, our our other European uh, countries will will take a, a favorable view on it. So thinking positively then, or hypothetically, whatever way you want to look at it, say we do get the PGI status for Irish grass-fed beef. What will that mean or do for our beef sector as a whole and as beef producers fundamentally? Yeah, so it it, um, it, it underlines, as, as, as I said, that um, we, we have a unique product in Irish grass-fed beef. It means from a commission perspective that until now, when we promote Irish beef in our European markets, the the, the Commission uh, does not allow us to lead with the blatant promotion. I would say of our Irishness that isn't allowed. So we promote under the quality mark, um, uh, quality assured um, Irish beef and the standards that are are associated with that. But we can't lead with Irishness now that this PGI is Irish grass fed beef. We we have to, in fact, um, use that name all the time. So we can be very explicit and open uh, in in promoting. So that's a huge thing that uh, it, it frees us, if you like, uh, and, and and allows us to use that. There is, of course, the the recognition that consumers have that this is a unique and and premium product, and uh, generally is is worth um, paying more for. That obviously has to be established in the market in terms of uh, building that reputation out and building the associations between the two. Um, but we 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 do know we've done a good lot of um, consumer research around this where it lands better, um, and and we can we can build that out with those consu- uh, sorry customers, the retailers, food service that want to put that um, the the logo, the PGI logo on the pack. Uh, with us and bring that forward and of course we'll only be doing that where we can get an advantage out of it and and where those um, customers will be will be looking for a a premium on it and that's how we'll build the premium out you know even with uh, things we mentioned before like uh, parma ham or whatever there is no uh, automatic premium there it has to be built like like we always have have to do um, but generally, those products do sell for more. Um, it does give a recognition. We have to re- remind ourselves that in a lot of, especially Mediterranean European countries, um, you know, there there is not a huge recognition of of uh, Irish beef amongst the general consumer. Um, there is a lot of pressure, especially at the moment, on uh, preference for regional products and things. So. Proving our European origin and this recognition by Europe that it's a special product, that will help us overcome some of those hurdles um, and get into more of the premium ranges and 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 access those those markets. And we do know, because it is Irish grass fed beef, consumers there have a you know a great interest and will pay more for grass fed beef. So we'd be very hopeful. It's really the sole reason we've we've done this is to try and get that premium in the market um, and that that will, will channel back to farmers. And is it aimed more at exports rather than domestic markets? It can be both. It can okay. be both. But obviously the, 
the potential when we uh, export 85 or 90 percent of of our our, our beef uh, the potential to make a real difference and to uh, to to bump it on and and and, and get that premium in the market is much greater um you know we we sell our beef well in the Irish market already not to say that it it couldn't help um but to to grow especially against uh the domestic product in that market and then even more the other imported products into those markets if you took Italy for instance there's beef from all the other european countries there's argentinian beef uh you know we hear a lot about australian beef and uh, the likes of the UK or something like that. So it would help us with all of those kinds of things to uh, to assert ourselves there and and justify the premium that we're not just another import. Oh, so it would be recognised also in the UK, for example, which isn't in the in the European Union anymore. Perfect. Yes, as part of the uh, the Brexit withdrawal agreement, there's a, a an, an agreement on GIs, and obviously a part of this. GIE um, politically is within the UK. That's true. Uh, and, and that's why it probably took us a little longer to sort out because it might have been one of the first cross-border uh, ones to, uh, to to come through uh, the, the commission. So yes, there is a, a recognition um, of those, uh, th- those GIs. And indeed in, in the UK, historically, there have been quite a lot of um, uh, beef or meat um, GIs um, um, Scotch beef, uh, as as probably the most prominent one, but also things like West Country uh, beef, Welsh uh, beef and lamb. Uh, so it's it's um, it should be of interest in that market, which is still our single biggest market as well. Um, we we shouldn't forget that. Yeah, absolutely. And what you've said there from the consumer feedback, or I suppose consumer research that you've done, and the fact that if we get the PGI for Irish grass for beef we can push it as Irish. That to me sounds like there's a consensus among Europe, certainly, that things from Ireland or things, you know, that are are coming Irish produce is what people are looking for in terms of what they think and associate with it. The grass-fed image, the green, the yellow butter and so on. People obviously view that as premium or in their own heads as something coming from Ireland as being very natural. Absolutely, and that that that's what we had to prove in order to, uh, you know, the commission don't hand these out easily. So no. we 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 had to actually give the proofs of where is that reputation justified. So things like consumer research, um, coverage in 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 uh, by by journalists, um, uh, um, endorsements by chefs or meat experts, all these different things that. Uh, showed that that reputation is there. Also, scientific research into uh, the the functional differences that grass fed beef has more conjugated linoleic acids or omega threes or vitamin D, uh, things like that. That there is a physical difference. Also, that you, you talked about the the color. So there's a deeper red uh, meat color associated with um, grass fed beef, a yellower fat. Um, so these are things that we scientifically had to show that proof. And also we we do a lot of insights work, have, have done uh, over many years, and showing that there's actually a taste preference for this uh, product in the market. Also things like awards. So that's that's what we had to do to get here, but it also gives us that we know we, we do a um, meat chopper uh, tracker every every quarter through all of our European main markets. And we we're always testing on that as well. What are the the points that will make consumers more likely to buy and to pay a little bit more for that product? Um, and grass fed is 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 one of those things. So it it really should you know we 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 have good 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 evidence to show that this should um, you know this should really work well together um, to to get us on and. Well, hopefully we'll have some good news in that respect. So in, in the next two, two and a half months, if if some decision comes from the European Commission. And I just want to touch briefly, um, Mark, while I have you, maybe on the wider beef sector. Um, we're in August now, heading towards the back end of the year. What, I suppose, you know, finish cattle towards the back end of the year, what is the, that looking like in terms of the outlook? 
Yeah, obviously we we we've seen a, a number of weeks now um, where where prices have been have been slipping, um, and uh, you know that that's not what we like to see, but it it generally does happen at this time of year where we have uh, increased supplies coming through um, off grass in in the autumn, um, but prices have been on the slide uh, in in fairness um, throughout uh, Europe. Um, the the European price there is um, four seventy four reported last uh, week in March it was five euro fifteen uh, you know our own similarly uh, went from five twenty eight back in March to four seventy two even the British price that is 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 um, considerably higher it was at five seventy two then and is five twenty seven so. You know, there's in the in the order of of forty to fifty five cents gone out of all of those prices. It's a reflection, really, of consumers buying less. Um, looking at uh, UK Cantar figures, um, prices, beef prices there, um, were for the the year uh, to date compared to the previous year, uh, prices up by ten percent and volumes down by four percent. So. There is a real correlation we see there everywhere that consumers are finding it hard to pay the the extra money for beef, and there are cheaper proteins uh, that they can uh, they they can reach for. They're probably also eating less protein or uh, animal protein. Overall, it's not anything to do with an overall trend against animal protein. It's really an, an economic thing because again, in the shopper insights, we see that. Consumers are still what we call engaging with the category, so they want to buy. They come in intending to buy beef. They have all those positive associations around taste and uh, and, and nutrition, so they they want to purchase. But ultimately, they're dropping off at the last uh, at the last point uh, because they're seeing something better value somewhere else. That's true. I suppose everybody is looking at their shopping bill now and has seen that the total, I suppose, for all products of their shopping bill go up. You know, we've we've kind of just come through very difficult times in terms of cost of living and people are looking at their energy costs as well and, and, and people are pulling back. But if we look um, towards the end of the year, but then into next year, do you think it will come around again, Mark? Or are we looking at this kind of sustained trend for the next, you know, certainly short, medium term? Yeah. It's really bringing it back to the economic situation. Um, what's working in our favor is that um, beef cattle supplies are down. They're down here, 30,000 head, which has already happened. So that's why we have relatively for the year quite, uh, quite a lot of cattle around at the moment. But still, it's not, it's not something unusual or, or in normal times. Um, we we'd deal with that better. Um, but for next year, we're seeing again that uh, cattle numbers will will drop. So we're 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 thinking it could be up to sixty thousand head less of cattle processed next year in Ireland. Um, in Europe, there uh, there was one point seven percent less cattle processed. That's sort of been happening all the last number of years. So you've considerably less um, beef around. So if we can hope. That the economic situation does improve, um, we should see that coming back. Because again, I go back to the, the shopper insights. It's not that consumers are saying we've gone off meat; they want to eat the meat, but um, it's it's the economic situation. So I suppose it's the money in their pocket at any given time. That's it. Yeah. So once that comes back, we'd be quite confident that um, we'll we'll be in a better situation again. And finally, Mark, just before I let you go with beef exports abroad, how are we looking uh, vis-a-vis 2023 into 2024 in terms of our export potential and new markets? Uh, new markets, obviously, we had China come on board right. um, earlier in the year. Um, there are a few other markets that are that are uh, coming coming on board. They're just in the in the last phases uh, in terms of international markets now, uh, which is is very very welcome. Uh, we're getting great engagement from Asia, from Chinese, from um, Japanese, Singaporean uh, buyers that have been in the country this year and still coming in, more coming in the next few weeks. Um, so the interest is there. Um, and Japan would be working quite well. 
China still has a few post-COVID problems that are are affecting the economy and people doing the same thing here. So uh, as as here in Europe, where uh, they're under pressure and and just um, uh, the 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 meat purchase is 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 difficult for them. So again, it's it's a little subdued. We see global prices everywhere um, coming back. Um, maybe the U.S. is is, is a more immediate um, global opportunity. That cattle numbers there have gone down a lot with the with the, the the droughts. We're still in the culling phase, but where next year supplies will be quite tight, um, and that could just globally see more demand for for beef and cattle in the world's biggest um, uh, beef consumption market. Um, and and open up a few more opportunities. We'd hope. I suppose that if we get the PGI for Irish grass fed beef, then that's something that you can go to market with also as a premium product. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. All of these things work together. Um, and if you if if we have a you know a, a better demand situation, every country is importing a little more. Um, and yeah, PGI works uh, works pretty much everywhere because. If you're a you know a Japanese or an American consumer, uh, they know PGIs. They see it on things like Parma ham or European wines and different things that they uh, import. And indeed, we do have the uh, the um, EU promotional fund that we we've used um, quite well to develop a lot of those um, th- those export markets that we could potentially put in an application for. Uh, PGI uh, products, maybe combining with some other European products like cheeses or wines, um, and we'd be in good company there to develop the premium uh, with that. So that's certainly um, another angle we're looking at. Absolutely. A lo- lot of opportunity there so for the beef sector going forward. That's all we have time for on AgriFocus. Uh, for this episode, I want to thank my guest, uh, Beef Sector Manager with Borby and Mark Sieg for joining us. And please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or indeed wherever you get your podcasts. It makes a massive difference. Please stay tuned to AgriFocus and indeed the Farming Week podcast from AgriLand. You find them on the app online or indeed on the Uh, Spotify or Apple Podcasts store if you want to go in there and uh, they're all free so you can listen to them at your leisure. That's all for now. I'm Stella Meehan and talk to you next time on the next episode of AgriFocus.